there are certain ships for which no introduction is needed. Ships that are so famous, they have gone down in history, even to those who may not pay any attention to naval matters. Ships such as Victory, or Constitution, or Enterprise. Ships that dozens of books and documentaries have covered in detail. One of those ships is the Fletcher-class destroyer USS Johnston. It is hard to really understate how brave and heroic her doom stand was, how badly the odds were stacked against her and her crew, even as they went in again and again and again, even as their ship was shot to ribbons beneath them and gradually lost her ability to fight back or even steam away. One only has to look at her wreck, recently rediscovered, to see just what kind of pounding she truly took. Of course, when one looks at the man in command, and how Johnston began her career, her later actions seem rather less surprising. She was a ship destined to be in the thick of it, and when given the chance, her captain and crew jumped right for it. Johnston's career began in Seattle, laid down on May 6, 1942. Johnston was launched a little less than a year later, on March 25, 1943. It would only take until October of the same year for her to be commissioned, which even for World War II standards, was quite speedy. This fast pace of construction is certainly impressive, by all metrics, but it would quickly be overshadowed by her actual commissioning ceremony. That would prove to be quite a sign of things to come, as one Lieutenant Commander Ernest E. Evans took command. He stood up in front of her crew on October 27, 1943, and is said to have made a rather famous statement, one that showed exactly the kind of man that Evans was, and exactly what he intended USS Johnston to do. This is going to be a fighting ship. I intend to go in harm's way, and anyone who doesn't want to go along had better get off right now. Now there is a second part of this that often gets left out, though everyone's favorite destroyer book, Last Stand of the Ten Can Sailors, does include it. That second part is also rather reflective of Johnston's eventual fate. Now that I have a fighting ship, I will never retreat from an enemy force. Considering the same book notes that Evans initially wanted to be a Marine, this is probably to be expected. It would also explain Johnston's tendency to, instead of escorting carriers, be stuck in on shore bombardment in support of the Marines. That's for later, though. First she had to finish her sea trials and the like. Johnston would remain on such training duties until mid-January of 1944. At that point, she went to Hawaii for more training, and then on to the Gilbert and Marshall Islands, arriving at the end of January, at which point she immediately jumped into shore bombardment duty. This she would do until the end of February, moving between various atolls in the area. Notable events here include bombarding Kwajalein on the 2nd of February, which is notable in that Johnson was so front and center that she took aboard wounded marines. This was in keeping with Evans' ideals, and also the first view of what the men on shore were enduring to Johnston's Navy crew. Evans would take it a step further, going ashore on Namur Island on February 4th. As for Johnston herself, she would eventually be pulled back from the Marshall Islands at the end of February, and rotated onto escort duty along with her sister ship USS Hole. This would not be the last time the two Fletchers would be serving with one another, as we'll see. Also, as a fun side note here before I move on, during her time in the Marshalls, Johnston ended up delayed on moving between islands at one point when her condensers were clogged and overheated by jellyfish. As it would turn out, though, Johnston's time on escort duty would prove short-lived. By the end of March, she was back to shore bombardment duty, this time in the Solomons. Here she would continue her trend of getting in close and firing accurate barrages at shore positions, earning praise from the men she was assigned to support. Evans trained his crew well, and they showed it, by hitting Japanese positions with unerring accuracy and saving the lives of many a marine or soldier ashore. She would perform similar duties in the Carolines during this period, with the odd break to patrol or escort other ships through to the end of April. When May 1944 rolled around, Johnston spent most of it on escort duties of various flavors. It was during this period that she got her one submarine kill, I-176. 
The submarine was the most successful of her class, even getting the honor of being the only Japanese submarine to sink an American submarine, that being the USS Corvina in November 1943. Johnson would put an abrupt end to that career in concert with USS Haggard and USS Franks. The three destroyers would all attack I-176 with depth charges on May 16th, eventually sinking the submarine after midnight on May 17th. After that incident, it was back to escort duty until June of 1944. With the coming of the invasion of the Marianas, Johnston would, eventually, get back into shore bombardment duty. For the initial phases of the operation, though, she remained on escort duty. One can imagine Evans getting impatient at the wait for real combat, until in late July, Johnston's metaphorical leash was finally let loose. At which point she took to bombarding the island of Guam, like she had been built for that one singular purpose. Johnston consistently sailed closer than she was technically supposed to, in the interest of putting accurate fire ashore. She would, more than once, fire more than her allotment of shells, at which point Evans would go directly to command, sometimes literally as he hopped in her whaleboat and went to the flagship, to get more ammunition. His direct support of the troops ashore got him that ammunition. Johnston fired so much that her guns glowed red and she had to stop, again more than once, just to let them cool down. Through it all, Evans continued to insist on getting closer and shooting more. Here was a man who understood what the men ashore were going through and was determined to help them as much as possible. To quote, again, Tin Can Sailors, Damn it, they need fire support and we're going to give it to them. Evans and Johnston were a combination that the men ashore were always happy to see supporting them. It's telling when a destroyer gets close enough to shore that small arms fire could be directed her way. She even brought her 40mm guns to bear at points, which really says everything about how close she was. At one point, when it graduated to a shore battery firing on her, Johnston, on her sixth salvo, hit an ammunition dump, which promptly exploded and destroyed a gun nearby. At which point, Johnston then switched fire and destroyed another coast defense gun. By the time Johnston was pulled off the duty on July 29th, she had fired nearly 4,000 rounds of 5-inch ammunition, along with over 3,000 rounds out of her 40mm mounts. In a classically Evans statement, the commander considered it a good thing that he took his ship so close to shore, because he basically baited the Japanese to focus fire on Johnston and not the troops ashore, which both spared them of suffering and exposed positions that might otherwise have remained hidden. And through it all, Johnston evaded damage. This would, however, be the last time that she performed such duties. Johnston was reassigned to escort duty once again, generally with the escort carriers. She would bounce through multiple formations from August to October of 1944, before finally ending up with the formation that would go down in history by its call sign, Taffy 3. The following story is a well-known one, so I will not go into great detail on it in this video. I will, however, likely do a video on the battle off Samar as a whole at a later date. For now, the morning of October 25th, 1944, began as many others had during the Philippine operations. The escort carriers flew off ground support operations, and the destroyers, and destroyer escorts, patrolled around watching for submarines or air attack. The previous day had, admittedly, been an exciting one for the American forces, as they sent Musashi to the bottom and seemingly drove off the Japanese center force. Halsey, meanwhile, had charged off to the north after the Japanese carriers, leaving the lighter forces to guard the landings. Taffy 3 would, as such, be the first to spot that the center force had not, in fact, retreated. At around 7 a.m. that morning, Taffy 3 suddenly found itself staring down a formation that outmassed it by a substantial margin led, of course, by the super battleship Yamato. Even the smaller and older Nagato, or the Congo and Haruna, were still terrifying on their own. And then there were the cruisers and destroyers. Taffy 3 was so ludicrously outgunned in that moment that the only choice they had was to try and run. Something made difficult by the slow speed of the escort carriers, which could never hope to outrun even the slowest of the Japanese capital ships. 
So, when Evans found himself in Johnston as the closest ship to the Japanese, he did what he had said he would do. He fought it out. First, and without orders, he had his ship worked up to full speed and her engines making smoke. Johnston performed zigzag maneuvers between the oncoming Japanese forces and the retreating escort carriers. That wasn't enough for Evans, though, as he opened fire on the Japanese at a range of about 18,000 yards at 7.10 a.m. Johnston, unsurprisingly, drew fire from a good portion of the Japanese formation at that point. Not that it stopped her. She simply committed to a torpedo run, blasting away with her main battery as she charged at the Japanese formation. Johnston would end up closing to within 10,000 yards of ships that could quite easily sink her. Her fire was directed, in particular, at the heavy cruiser Kumano. Johnston fired more than 200 shells during her charge, of which many hit their target, setting Kumano ablaze. The more severe damage would come, however, when Johnston's salvo of 10 torpedoes sailed in her direction. At least one of those torpedoes hit Kumano in the bow, causing severe damage and forcing the cruiser to retreat from the battle. Unfortunately, it was at this point that Johnston's luck started to take a turn for the worse. Emerging from her smokescreen, she was quickly brought under the guns of the Japanese formation once again. And this time, Yamato hit her with three 18.1-inch shells, along with three 6-inch shells. This damage was attributed to 14-inch shells for the longest time, but has more recently been given to the Super Battleship. Regardless, Johnston suffered many casualties among her crew. Her aft fire room and engine room were knocked out, causing her to lose power to her stern 5-inch mounts and her steering engine. The destroyer was reduced to limping along at 17 knots at this point. With steering on manual control, she struggled to continue along. Meanwhile, on her bridge, Commander Evans had his helmet and uniform shirt blown off, leaving him bare-chested and bleeding from multiple shrapnel wounds. He had also lost a couple of his fingers at this point, which he made a point of tying off himself so the medical officer could look after more severely injured crewmen. Evans remained in command and hardly let his wounds slow him down. Fortunately for the destroyer and her crew, a rain squall showed up and allowed them 10 minutes to figure out the damage and what could be done about it. Among other things, they got their fire direction radar up and running well enough to fire on a nearby Japanese destroyer and then a cruiser only a little further away. In both cases, entirely under radar control, without any line of sight on their target. This was after restoring power to her stern guns, albeit with one of them on local control, cut off from central fire direction. Johnston's fight was nowhere near over at this point, even when she exited the rain squall. The rest of the escorts had been ordered to attack with their own torpedoes during this process, and Johnston slid in right alongside them. She had no torpedoes left to fire, but Evans was not going to just retreat, even if his ship was, by all rights, severely damaged enough to justify it. As such, the battered destroyer joined the charge. Johnston's guns took another cruiser under fire, even as the destroyer turned to pull away with the other escorts. A process that almost saw Johnston collide with her sister, Heerman, as that destroyer moved to engage Japanese cruisers. Luckily for all involved, the crippled destroyer and her much healthier sister managed to avoid each other. Incredibly narrowly avoid each other at that. Most destroyers would have taken that as a sign to pull away and get out of the fight. Most destroyers weren't Johnston, and most captains weren't Commander Evans. Johnston worked back up to her 17 knot top speed, and instead of doing the same thing, decided the best thing to do was continue right on with fighting the center force. Continuing to steam along on her one working engine, Johnston spotted Gambier Bay under fire from a Japanese cruiser around 8.30. As such, Johnston charged to within 6,000 yards of the aforementioned cruiser and attempted to draw fire off the carrier. This she failed at, as Johnston had to break off and engage a group of Japanese destroyers chasing the other escort carriers, which promptly broke off their attack, albeit not before damaging Johnston more in turn. Evidently deciding this wasn't enough action for one day, Evans, upon receiving a report of cruisers closing in on the carriers, kept Johnson in the battle. For 30 minutes, she would engage cruisers on one side 
and destroyers on the other. Her bow turrets were knocked out of action, and her bridge was engulfed in flames, to the point that Evans had to move aft to command the ship from relative safety. Johnson was beginning to suffer terribly at this point. In addition to the damage already mentioned, she was getting peppered by 5 and 6 inch shells all along her hull. All but one of her 5 inch guns were knocked out, with that one firing on local control. Her remaining engine was shot out from under her, and Johnston drifted to a halt, surrounded by Japanese ships. With the Valiant destroyer beginning to go under, Commander Evans ordered abandoned ship at about 9.45. By 10.10, Johnston had sunk by her battered bow, leaving her surviving crew in the water. Of the 327 men aboard her at the start of the battle, only 141 would survive their time in the water. Commander Evans would not be one of them. His exact fate remains unknown to this day. Conflicting reports abound, though the most commonly accepted is that he survived long enough to make it into the water before dying at some point before rescue arrived. He would posthumously be awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions that day. Johnston certainly lived up to what he had hoped, though. Few ships can claim to have fought as long and hard against such overwhelming odds as she had. And when her wreck was eventually discovered, well, I covered this recently in a video on the Leyte wrecks in general. Suffice it to say that Johnston's wreck shows the pounding she took. Her stern is broken off where the heavy shells hit her. Her hull resembles Swiss cheese with 5 and 6 inch shell holes. You can see exactly where each recorded hit came in, at least on the remaining hull. Where the shells that disabled her bow guns hit. Where the shell that wounded Evans went in. And many, many other impacts that were recorded in survivor reports. Perhaps most importantly though, USS Johnston rests upright with her guns pointing towards a long gone enemy. Johnston would make Commander Evans proud in that, I like to think. Thank you for watching, remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.